Hi, my name is Liz Thompson, and this is a video for IME 430 at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. This is a um, lecture on acceptance sampling. So acceptance sampling is the idea that you have this lot of items that, um, a whole bunch of items, which is population or the lot, and then there's some that are defective, and you want to detect if there's defective, so you take a sample. And that sample will have some defectives in it and some good ones in it. And what you need to know is when to accept the lot or when to reject the lot. So I'm going to go through an um, introduction. I'm going to talk about types of sampling plans, operating operations operating characteristic curves, consumer and producer risk, cost benefit, and then I'm going to um, talk about the two other videos you're going to watch, which is creating OC curves and reading um, the tables. So in the introduction, the main things I want to talk about is this acceptance sampling is pretty old. It was developed in around the 1930s. Um, when you started looking at how do you know if bullets are good during World War II, and they didn't want to destroy all the bullets to see if they were good, so they um, thought of taking a sample. And so uh, inspect acceptance sampling is used when you um, have to dis destroy the items and or if 100% inspection takes too long to, um, to do. So acceptance sampling is the idea that you take a lot or a bunch of items and then you sample those. Or in a con control chart, this is the idea that you're going to be um, inspecting these things um, sort of in a continuous basis. So every hour, every half hour, you take three or four samples and you test them. That's what we've been doing before in this class. But this is a little bit different way of sampling. It's often used in shipping and receiving because you have you accepting something from a supplier or you're sending it to a consumer. So you want to make sure those things that you're accepting or sending are um, are the correct kind of quality. So um, lots of the ways of doing acceptance sampling is defined in the mill standard. Um, 105. Actually, this was canceled and replaced by ISO 2959. And so there's definitely standards and we'll look at that or I'll have, a, have you direct you to a video about how to use those tables to um, do some of these things. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the various types of sampling plans that are available. Um, first of all, you always have to make sure that the sample is random, that there's no bias, that you're not taking the first item out of each box or anything like that. So the way you're going to do that is assign a number to the items and then use a random number generator to tell you which items you're going to be um, testing. You could do a stratified random sample where you say, well, I'm going to take some samples out of the first box or the second box or the third box. Usually that's not um, recommended. We want to try to do it as random as possible. Um, so two types of sampling that goes on, attribute sampling and then variable sampling. Attribute sampling is the one that's used most often, the idea that this is either acceptable or not acceptable. So you can measure something and yet then it still becomes acceptable or not acceptable. There's lot sizes, which is this capital N, and there's sample size, which is the lowercase n, and always the lowercase n is less than the, the lot size. And then you define non-conforming item C that you're willing to accept. Um, in a variable sample, we have this same thing, but it's a continuous measurement. There's still lot sizes, there's still samples, but what you um, develop is an upper control limit and a lower control limit. Um, around this, you will accept it, and within this you will accept it, and outside of these um, limits you will reject it. So it sort of becomes an attribute chart. So the kinds of sampling plans is that you can do a single, a double, multiple, sequential, and then you could also do a con um, st statistical process control or control chart. Um, but for us, we have these items defined as, um, like I said, the lot size, the sample size, the lower bound of acceptance, the upper bound of acceptance, and the defect rate in the sample. So let's just look at an example. We have a lot of um, 9,000 when we're going to take a sample of 60. 
and the C is going to be one, which means that if it's one or fewer, one or zero, then we will accept it. If it's two or above, um, then we will reject it. In a single sampling plan, R is always C plus one. You could also do a double sampling plan. So you can see that what I did is I had a first sample where I had a reject as one, except, let, except C value is one, but the R value is now five, which means that we reject if it's five, six, or seven, but that in between values, if it's two, three, or four, we're not sure what to do. And so we have a double sampling. We take another sample, and then we say that if it's six or less, from both of them, then we are going to accept it. And if it's seven or more, then we're going to reject it. Um, we're going to really just look at the double sample, I mean the single sampling plans, but you could also do multiple or sequences or control charts. So one of the key things in an acceptance sampling is looking at operation operating characteristic curves. Um, these curves are help us decide um, based on the lot what is the probability of acceptance? So the idea here is this is an idealized um, chart. The idea that the lot or the percent effective within an item um, is is um, is what we're trying to detect. And so if we have a, a curve that looks like this that's perfectly discriminating, meaning that if it was one, if it was a half a percent defective, there was a hundred percent chance percent chance that we will accept it. If it's 2% effective, then there's 0% chance that we would accept it. This would be great if we had curves like this, but we don't have this unless we do 100% um, sampling. So when we look at an oper um, operating characteristic curves, it usually looks like this. So it's a lot more um, slope is, is not vertical. Um, it's a lot more um, at, a, at an angle. And so what we, the way we read this is, let's say that we're okay with about a 3% um, defect rate. So that would be good for us. So in a sample that's 52 and we're having an acceptance rate of two, that means that if we have two, if it's 2% defective, the probability of accepting the lot is about, is about 90%. So that's pretty good. I mean, it's a pretty accurate kind of um, example. But when we look at something like if it's 4%, which is above what we kind of want it to be, right? We want it to be three, but if it's 4%, the probability of accepting it is 65%, which is not great. Like if we don't want it to be accepted at 4%, but 65% of the time we're going to accept it. So this is not exactly the characteristics we want for this. But let's say we actually um, have a 10% defective rate in our um, lot. The probability of, ex of, of accepting it is only 12%. So that's pretty good. I mean, we're not gonna accept lots very often that have this much of a defect. And that's kind of how we read this curve. The other thing about the curves is they change depending on the sample size. So you can see all these colors are different sample sizes of n of 32, 50, 80, 125, 200. And so you can see that if we have a 2% um, quality in our lot, the probability of accepting it if we have a 200 um, a 200 sample curve is only around 10%. Um, and if we have a, um, if we, in this, in this example, if we have a um, sample that's 32, the probability of accepting it is 90%. So you can see that we can distinguish these values a little bit better. Now these curves also change depending on the number of acceptance numbers. So if we have zero, one, two, or three. So you can see that obviously if we accept something with zero, only if there's no items in the um, value, but there's 5% defect in the lot, we're not going to accept that very often. So the probability of acceptance is pretty low. So you can see the curves change um, depending on the sample size and the acceptance rate. Um, and so the 
it, if you then it, then the question becomes, well, how do you decide what to do? Well, you can see here that if it's a two percent um, um, defect rate, there's not a lot of difference between a C value of two and three. So we might be willing to accept a two value because they don't get that much better when we get to a three. So then it becomes, well, how how is it we decide? Some of the ways we decide is by looking at consumer risk, mm, says Rick, and producer risk. So in the case of a consumer risk, what we're saying is what's the probability of, of um, accepting a bad lot? So we're going to say, yeah, this is when we're inspecting it, we say this is good and we send it off to the consumer. So that's the consumer risk of getting a bad lot, even though we've said it's good. And so in this case, we often accept a level of 10 percent for this. And that's the, the probability of accepting a bad lot. On the other side, the um, the producer's risk is the probability of rejecting a good lot. Oops, sorry. So we want to really kind of balance the two of these. Like, how are we going to decide when this is um, when it's okay to accept a good lot? Um, with these kinds of alpha and beta errors. So I'm actually going to go to here. So what we try to do is design a sampling plan where we have the we have sort of design specifications that we are willing to accept where the producer risk or the probability of um, rejecting a good lot and the consumer risk, which is the probability of accepting a bad lot, that those are kind of minimized within our design specs. And the way we do that is to define these um, AQL and LTPD um, to try to decide where are our design specifications going to be OK. And we often use 95% probability of acceptance for the AQL. And for the um, lot tolerance for FET def percent defective, we often accept a 10% probability for that. So that's just a rule of thumb that we um, go by when we're doing that. this. So um, next thing I'm going to look at is, um, well, then how do you make these kinds of decisions? And um, one of them is looking at the cost of um, sampling versus the benefit of avoiding, which is also equal to avoiding costs. So the cost of sampling is the cost of the labor to sample, the cost of the equipment, the cost to destroy the items. But the avoided costs or the benefits are you avoid returns processing, you avoid risk of catastrophic problems associated with um, a defective item, you avoid the loss of reputation. Now you can see that those costs um, or the benefits or the avoided costs are quite hard to um, estimate, but the cost of sampling is pretty easy to, to get. So often what we do is just look at the cost and we ask ourselves, are the benefits going to be more than this cost or less? So it's sort of like a break even kind of question. So when we're deciding, we want to look at the consumer impact and specifically for sure looking at the severity of the impact of the defect to the users. If it's a, a medical product, it could actually be um, life altering. And so you want to make sure that you minimize this. And then from the producer's impact, we're looking at the cost of the company and the benefits of the company of doing this this um, this kind of uh, inspections. And we also use AQL charts to help us to make decisions about this based on standards. So there's two more videos that I want you to watch. Um, the first is creating OC carts for a single sampling plan. And then the second is using AQL charts. Um, I will see you in class. Bye.